Hello, and welcome to Religion and Life. I'm your host, Ozzy Oswald. Here at TV, we're situated in the heart of Appalachia, and I have the privilege of teaching about Appalachian religious traditions in the Department of Philosophy and Religion at ASU. It's my distinct pleasure today to welcome a scholar who has studied not only American religions in depth, but also the regional characteristics of religious traditions in Appalachia. Dr. Bill J. Leonard, recently retired from Wake Forest University Divinity School, is joining me today to talk about the diversity of religion in Appalachia. Welcome, Bill. It's great to have you and great to see you again. Thanks, Ozzy, and, and I'm honored to be with you, and it's good to see you, too. I want to tell the audience just a little bit about you. You have uh, quite an impressive resume. Uh, you're currently a uh, professor of divinity emeritus at the Wake Forest University Divinity School. You were the uh, founding dean of the Wake Forest University Divinity School and once held the Dunn Chair of Baptist Studies there. I'm sure there's more. Um, the author of some 25 books, including uh, the book we'll be talking about today, uh, Christianity in Appalachia. You authored and edited that volume, and my students are currently reading it. Uh, but you've contributed much um, to the study of church history, to the study of American religion, and in this case, the study of Appalachian religion. So thank you for your service through all those years. I'm, I'm just really glad to get to talk with you about Appalachian religion today, Ozzy. So. Well, one of the things that uh, we've been talking about in our class is that in your book, you dispel a myth about Appalachian religion, I think. Uh, we tend to see the region, the culture, and the religious traditions as somewhat monolithic and homogenous. But in your book on Christianity and Appalachia, you bring out that there is great diversity and real, really pluralism in the traditions of Appalachia. So could you talk just a little bit about your efforts to, to bring that thesis to the forefront? Well, I thought I would begin with a quote from a, a lecture I, I gave not long ago on Appalachian religion, and it comes from our mutual friend Ron Eller, uh, his book, Uneven Ground Appalachia Since 1945, and he writes this, Appalachia endures as a paradox in American society, in part because it plays a critical role in the discourse of national identity, but also because the region's struggle with modernity reflects a deeper American failure to define progress in the first place. We know that Appalachia exists because we need it to exist to define what we are not. The notion of Appalachia as a separate place, a region set off from mainstream culture and history, has allowed us to distance ourselves from the uncomfortable dilemmas that the story of Appalachia raises about our own lives and the larger society. And I do, I do think we look at the region because of its identity and uniqueness, but we also, with Eller, have to ask what it means, particularly now as as uh, we're not only talking about modernity, but post-modernity. Right. And, and so I would start by saying one of the great lessons for me uh, has been, uh, as, you, as you pointed out, the diversity uh, of both practice and uh, uh, belief uh, in the country. And, and we've all been influenced by Deborah McCauley's 1990 book, hard to believe it's that old, uh, when she talks about what she calls indigenous mountain religions, those that came in very early, and then the way in which denominations came into the region, all, all, often in their home mission societies, acting like there hadn't been any Christianity in the region until the Baptists, the Methodists, and the Presbyterians got there. Uh, yeah. in their denominational system. So, so And now, because... Um, of the number of diverse religions that are coming. When we did the book on Appalachian religion, uh, Mary Lee Darty, who wrote the chapter on the serpent handlers, said we need to do a second volume that talks about uh, religion in Appalachia because of all the new uh, religious groups that were coming in there uh, in, in a variety of different ways. That's an interesting uh, comment you just made. I 
I had saved a question for the very end, but I'm just going to go ahead and ask it now because you just gave me a nice segue. Um, and the question was, if you were going to write this book now, uh, would you approach it differently or would you uh, um, add something? And I think you've hinted uh, at that, that uh, we, we tend to overlook the non-Christian traditions in Appalachia when we talk about religion in Appalachia. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and and I'll make a comment here and then that'll lead to, to a, a, another piece of this discussion. Um, the the coming of uh, a variety of different religions. One it, it is an illustration of the religious pluralism that is actually here in the country. We've talked about religious pluralism, about diversity, and now those groups are here. There's still small percentage of the religious overall religious population, but Muslims, of course, and Buddhists uh, and H Hindus as well are three great world religions that. Uh, are certainly in the country. And then because of the what's often called uh, the spirituality movement, many people in that in the region are not only reading uh, Catholic and Protestant uh, guides to spiritual reflection and contemplation, but also uh, Buddhist and uh, Hindu and and even Muslim to some extent writers uh, about that, about nurturing their own spirituality, even if they're still in churches. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back to um, some of those distinctive movements that you uh, mentioned with in regard to Deborah McCauley in a moment. But I want to follow up on your comment there. Do you think there are ways in which Appalachia is becoming less distinctive in terms of its religious makeup and maybe more like what we see uh, with broader cultural trends in America? Are, are some of those regional distinctive characteristics breaking down? Uh, I think so, uh, in part because of urbanization. Uh, and and it, again, depends uh, what part of Appalachia you're, you're living in. And, and uh, also because, as we run to all the time in this country, uh, because of media. Uh, an illustration I used was that uh, uh, primitive and uh, primitive Baptists and Pentecostals uh, had distinctive practices in their churches, uh, but that was only for a portion of the week. The rest of the time, because of television, they could be watching Robert Schuller and and uh, Joel Osteen and a whole and twenty four seven of religious uh, media that brought all kinds of new ideas to them, the prosperity gospel being an example of that, but also uh, other ways of reading scripture and reflecting. And, and you'd often hear people in churches say, well, our pastor says this, but Joel says this about the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And uh, I think that's been a major factor is just the, the uh, mediaization of the region first on television, first on radio, then on television, then online. You remember your uh, blessed colleague, Howard Dorgan, started studying App Appalachian religion, looking at uh, radio preachers in these little 300 watt radio stations uh, around the region, the language they used and the theology they put out. Well, that's now expanded considerably. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I'm glad you mentioned Howard because I think of him every Sunday morning as I drive yes. to church. I listen to those, some of those yeah. radio programs. Exactly. Remember exactly. him fondly. Um, yeah. So you, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned serpent handling, and I, I just want to kind of give it a throwaway line because that's what many people think of when they think about Appalachian religious tradition. So it seems like a, a lot of the study of Appalachian religion has focused on the exotic or the sense of yeah. others associated with the region, but that, that does the region a little bit of a disservice, doesn't it? It does. Uh, and and uh, also, uh, you, you, raise, you raise an interesting point. Uh, many of those identifiable religious traditions in the region are like a lot of Christian traditions uh, declining now because many of them grew because the families in those churches, particularly the primitive Baptists and the serpent handlers had uh, a lot of children and their children were nurtured into that tradition. As birth rate has declined, 
uh, so has born again uh, Christianity for many of those uh, in, in environments. And the last time I saw a statistic, there were maybe around 2,000 serpent handlers uh, that could be, that actually could be numbered, could be found. And that's been long enough ago that I'm sure those numbers are smaller. And the same with the primitive Baptists, for example, uh, because uh, of, of their method of conversion, uh, they, they're not rabidly evangelistic because you wait on the spirit to find the elect. Uh, so uh, as they had fewer children, they, de they are declining as well. I, I do want to add one quick point about the lesson I learned from the serpent handlers. I've written three articles about them, and it is this. For the serpent handlers, the sacrament is alive, and it can kill you. Right. So every time you go to worship, it isn't just confronting God. It's, a, it's confronting a matter of life and death. And that, that's one of the great lessons uh, that, that the serpent handlers <laughs> taught me over these years. Yeah, and it, it speaks to a level of commitment that uh, yes. is real, right, and, and very powerful. Um, so this brings up, an, uh, you mentioned serpent handling and the sacramental quality of that ritual. And we talk a lot about ritual and sacraments in my classes. Uh, and one of the things that seems distinctive about some of these um, traditions that you've mentioned in passing, we'll come back to that, is there are, there are rituals that we find um, nowhere else, really, mm -hmm. uh, like um, serpent handling, uh, river baptisms, mm -hmm. uh, foot washing ceremonies, and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, but these these rituals have sacramental qualities. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, well, obviously, you would with serpent handling because you just mentioned that. But. Yeah. Oh, I absolutely agree. And, and that was often in those communities a clear-cut source of religious identity. And, and when you talk about spirituality and particularly uh, uh, Christian spirituality, the, um, the issue of how you, how you convince people that the uh, subjective idea that God loved the world and sent God's only son into the world to forgive the world, that objective truth, that God loves everybody. How do you make that subjective by uh, showing people how they can receive that born again, that second uh, experience or that third baptism? And rituals are, were the way of doing that, of what Albert Cleeg called tangibilifying uh, religious experience. And, and that was a tangible way. I, I, I do, you, you remind me, Ozzy, of, one of my favorite stories is the primitive Baptist preacher who said, we used to give each other the kiss of peace at, uh, when we took communion, but some people got to linger in a little and we had to give it up. <laughs> so so th these, rituals, these rituals can bless and damn us if we're not careful. And, and the kiss of peace is a kiss on the lips. It's, it was a kiss on the mouth. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's a funny story. I, uh, men, 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 and women kissing each other on the mouth. Right. right. Uh -huh. So you you've mentioned uh, now on a couple of occasions uh, primitive Baptists, and and of course you you referenced Deborah McCauley, um, and her wonderful book, as you said, pointed out that there were indigenous and distinctive uh, traditions in Appalachia long before more mainstream traditions missionized the area. So um, these traditions like the primitives or the old regulars and some mm -hmm. independent holiness churches, um, they have a distinctive history to them. Is that right? Can you comment just a little bit on those traditions that really are found nowhere else but Appalachia? Uh, and and that's that's really the heartbeat and, and where so many of these lessons about sacraments and theology and and what I would call people's church uh, be, uh, are, are so important. The, the primitives were uh, very strict Calvinists who when when the revivals broke out in the country in places like Cane Ridge, Kentucky, uh, or even in the, the first Great Awakening and in the second war on the frontier, the Cal the, these primitive Baptists pushed back 
saying that, and primitive meant uh, we're the same as the New Testament church. Uh, you can trace us all the way back to Jesus at the Jordan River. And uh, the primitives pushed back against Sunday schools and theological schools and uh, 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 formal training for preachers and, and vacation Bible schools and, uh, and denominational uh, programs because they said they couldn't find it in the New Testament. But they were also uh, what, sadly enough, some scholars started calling hyper-Calvinists. And I've waged a, a, just a little private battle against using that term because one, because I thought it was so pejorative and then, and then because all the Calvinists I've ever known were hyper. So, so um, uh, I, I've, I've kind of pushed back about that term. I've called them strict Calvinists. And that is, they said, uh, you can't just walk in and pray a prayer and make God save you because the saving takes place only by the infusion from outside of God's grace. Human beings are totally depraved and they have no free will that allows them to choose salvation until God gives them the free will because they are in the elect. And that's a very important distinction in Appalachia, particularly over against the revivalistic uh, Baptists who were, who were converting people because everybody had the free will to choose uh, whether they could come into grace or not. And, and because of that, uh, the, the, the primitives were uh, intent on saying, no, we wait on religion. And you and I, you've probably heard this too. I've heard uh, contemporary primitive Baptists, if you said, are you a Christian? They would say, hopefully, yeah. right. meaning my hope is in Christ. I can't say that I that I know because salvation belongs to God and not to me. And, and because of that, the, the primitives rejected revivals, even when they were going on right around them. I, you, uh, that comment reminded me of something Howard Dorgan uh, once told me. He was attending a primitive Baptist funeral for the first time. And instead of the minister offering assurance to the family that the deceased was in mm -hmm. heaven, um, the minister said, well, we can only hope that the deceased uh -huh. is in That's heaven. right. So there's That's that right. kind of uncertainty that, that runs along with this very strict Calvinism, as you've called it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. and as you describe um, the primitives, um, it, it hardly sounds like the same thing that I grew up with in the Southern Baptist Church, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess you would call a revivalist Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. And um, one of your contributions to the book was on Southern Baptist. And um, you, you really took me back when you mentioned this. I think you called it the certain Southern Baptist nuts that um, um, gives us a, an insight into what it means to be a Southern Baptist. You mentioned the King James Version, the Zippered Edition, the, mm -hmm. the Sunday School Quarterly, the, mm -hmm. uh, the envelope, money envelopes, mm -hmm. the Vacation Bible School, the whole nine yards. Uh, mm -hmm. None of that in Primitive Baptist circles or even old regular Baptist, um, I, I take it. No, uh, or musical instruments either. Uh, the the, the, the God-given voice is the sweetest music this side of heaven, they'll say. And they couldn't find musical instruments in the Bible. And so they, they wouldn't use them, which was true of uh, John Calvin in the 16th century as well. Uh, but um, uh, the, the revivalistic Baptists, the Southern Baptists really come later. They're part of that group Deborah identifies as the uh, denominational mission boards that sent in preachers to organize churches in Appalachia. And uh, to bring them into what you described is is what the denomination uh, set forth as uh, uh, sources of bad Southern Baptist identity. The way you go to church, the way the way you fill out the records, the way you take up money, all of that was an identifiable way of being Southern Baptist. And uh, they often the the primitive. Uh, I, I've heard primitives sometimes call. Uh, those kind of churches, cracker snack churches, because they had uh, fellowship halls and they ate there. And and uh, the primitives and the old regulars, they'll have homecomings maybe, 
but they don't they wouldn't have a Wednesday night prayer meeting supper the way the Southern Baptists were because you were supposed to come to church to worship, not to uh, hang out, I guess you'd say. Yeah. And and that was that was a very sharp uh, contrast as well. If you were to ask a primitive or an old regular Baptist if they more identify with the theology of John Calvin or the practice of the early church, how do you think they would respond to that? Oh, early church. Early church. Uh, they, they, they wouldn't accept, and this is often a phrase, they wouldn't accept man-made doctrines. Okay. It's, it, and and you've, you've let me make a very important point. Thank you, uh, Ozzy. Uh, by primitive, uh, they mean we go back to the primitive church. We do it just like the New Testament did, which means outdoor baptism in the river or the creek. Um, and um, uh, we wash feet because the disciples did. And uh, and Jesus did with the disciples. And some of them even consider, as you touched on, uh, baptism, the Lord's Supper and foot washing as the three. This is often the word sacraments mm -hmm. uh, that that are commanded by the New Testament. And I've I've been to a number of foot washings in my life and I've never ceased to be moved. I always forget because I don't do it regularly. I've all, I always forget how powerful a symbol that is when people sit together as community and wash each other's feet. It, it's, it's a profound symbol to me. A symbol of uh, service, humility. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So another thing that kind of comes through in your book is um, you talk about uh, polarities in Appalachian religion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think that, uh, might be distinctive here is this um, what um, many of these indigenous traditions think about the clergy or the ministry. Yes. If, if we're in mainstream churches, we're we're used to thinking about the clergy as a profession. Um, people are educated at divinity schools uh, like Wake Forest, and they enter into a professional ministry. Uh, but in these indigenous um, Appalachian churches, there's really suspicion toward but the education of ministers and the idea that ministers should get paid or be professional in that sense. You're exactly right. And uh, a, another very good question for us to talk about. Uh, the old regulars and the primitives placed an emphasis on the call. And that was a call that God gave to the individual. The Pentecostals too often, early on at least. And that was, uh, if God calls you, God will teach you how to um, how to interpret the scripture in an orthodox way. And you don't need man-made schools to teach you. Uh, two, two or three quick things. One, uh, I, I found some research. Wake Forest University, what the Forest College was founded in 1834. And they brought the charter to the North Carolina legislature. And there were enough uh, legislators that were primitive Baptists, that they had to make a case for why they were founding a school that, where the prominent, the, 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 the most prominent constituency was going to be preacher boys. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, it, the charter passed, but not without discussion from the, the primitive uh, Calvinist Baptists, because, uh, and, and one, of, one of them said, was quoted as saying, uh, you can't teach preaching like you teach mathematics. Uh, and there was the feeling that God will use your, uh, uh, God will, will bless you with how to preach and how to do this, how to read the scripture and interpret it uh, because of your call, not because somebody else teaches you to do that. And actually, the, the first serpent handling preacher I met, a man named Arnold Saylor in Kentucky, he actually had a story he told my students when we met him that he couldn't read until he got filled with he got born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. And essentially, the the uh, he said, my wife has to read me letters that are written to us, but I can read the scripture because uh, the spirit uh, enlightened my mind. Hmm. That's amazing. 
Well, that that um, that brings up something that uh, it seems that the experiential component in some of these traditions, the, certainly the holiness yes. churches, but also the primitives yes. and the regulars, uh, that's a that's a, a very important part of of um, spiritual life, right? The experiential component, yes. the real power there. Yes, it's an absolute requirement for uh, the the. I, I'm. I'm hesitant to use evangelical because of all the weight that carries now. So I would say with the born again emphasis, the conversionist emphasis. And these were these were uh, communities of faith that said um, uh, you can't be nurtured. You, you can be taught. But but everyone who claims membership in the church has to be able to testify to a an experience of grace in their hearts through Christ. And, and baptism doesn't precede that the way it did in the churches that baptize infants and nurtured them to salvation. But it had to follow your own profession of faith. And that, that was the religious experience had to come to you. The subjective idea that God loves us has to become, ob, I mean, the objective has to become subjective uh, in our own hearts. And, and that that was the requirement for baptism as well. And uh, that and, and so, uh, again, the the born the, the, the revivalist tradition preached as if everyone could be saved and exercise free will uh, to choose. But and but the primitives and, and the <clears throat> the Calvinist Baptist said, no, as I said, God will give you the grace to believe. Uh, so for the Methodists and the Baptist <clears throat> revivalists, uh, God's grace and your free will participated together to make salvation happen. So um, uh, faith, faith and uh, repentance fall, preceded uh, what they call regeneration, being born again. For the primitives, regeneration precedes faith and repentance or repentance and faith. Yeah. So they, they in a way had two contradictory uh, plans uh, or morphologies of salvation. Yeah. And these sound like uh, kind of subtle theological differences to many of us, but they're very important to yes. uh, and, and I think in some ways uh, these, uh, these mountain churches and mountain traditions are probably more theologically sophisticated um, than many mainstream churches in that lay people can articulate um, what they believe and why and why it's important to them. Yes, which which leads me to <clears throat> um, also uh, reflect that that much of that is changing for reasons we said. And and um, mega churches in the Appalachian area uh are are one reason that that's happening because uh, people now can drive. There's a mega church on the edge of Buncombe and Madison County that's that's put there intentionally so people can drive into those churches and and that's affecting just mega churches are affecting these uh, quote indigenous churches in very significant ways. Yeah, and I would imagine people driving to that mega church probably drive past several small churches on their way. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, go ahead. And and then one other thing in the larger culture, I, I've been talking about for some time what I call the changing sociology of Sunday, mm -hmm. meaning that in our culture, uh, the the privilege that the religious privileging of Sundays is either declining rapidly or gone. And Sunday now carries a weight for families, even church members, that it didn't carry uh, often in, in those, uh, when the culture privileged uh, Sunday church uh, in ways that it doesn't now. And that is a huge factor in terms of church attendance in almost every tradition. Yeah, you and I are both old enough to remember when there was nothing open on Sunday. Yes. That's hard yes. to imagine now. Yes. Bill, this has been fascinating. Um, I really appreciate it. I feel like we're just getting started and our time is up. Um, 
maybe we can do this again in the future. But um, I certainly appreciate you joining us. And I think you're going to stick around and talk with my students a little bit. Yes. And thank you. Gr great questions that, that fueled our discussion. So thank you, Ozzy. Thank you, Bill. Well, that's it for Religion and Life for this week. I hope you'll join us again next week here on App TV as we continue to explore the relationship between religion, culture, and society. Until then, this is Ozzy Estrall.